This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. There are only 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. Three of those are about the Feast of Hanukkah. But why is it that even though Yeshua celebrated Hanukkah, why isn't it done in the Christian church? It is because in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, the Book of Maccabees, which tells us about Hanukkah, gives us the historical perspective, the background to understand why Yeshua would go up to the Feast of Hanukkah and why there's more text of the Gospels dedicated to this one incident, the Feast of Hanukkah, than any other thing except for the death, burial, and resurrection. Well, we have to get connected back to the origins, back to the scriptures to understand history, his story, so that the whole story can be told. And this weekend, during the Feast of Hanukkah, we are going to take you to Mount Sinai. The rocks are gonna cry out from the earth because the truth of the gospel of the kingdom is going to be heralded throughout the earth and this is our time. We are restoring the ancient paths. We're gonna go back and ask, what did Jesus do? He kept the feast of Hanukkah. The sun is set. It is the end of the sixth day. This is Hanukkah and this is Shabbat Night Live. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live. Welcome to the beginning of Hanukkah. Scott, it is good to be with all the saints. This is the broadcast that's going out to the world uh, that starts off our Hanukkah weekend. We've got a very special guest that is going to be with us tonight, someone who's been to Mount Sinai, uh, a, a Christian filmmaker who's been very much involved with this, and we've got a lot of guests who have actually been to Mount Sinai of recent uh, to start out this whole extravaganza. Indeed, I'm glad you brought uh, our guest on tonight because he was not able to be with us for Hanukkah, but you were able to get him uh, in an interview last minute, and uh, this is gonna be a great thing, and I, I was just excited to hear uh, that he's gonna be here and that uh, everyone else is gonna be here this weekend too. We have Jim and Penny Caldwell coming with, uh, to be here. Uh, and Ryan Moreau. That's right, without Jim and Penny Caldwell, we wouldn't have had the artifacts, we wouldn't have had all of the uh, video evidence and photographs that Ron Wyatt gave to me uh, concerning Mount Sinai, years before I ever met them, but they are here this weekend. And actually, uh, went to Mount Sinai with uh, with our guest that's going to be with us on Skype later. Oh, wow, and I understand that there's a connection between this guest and uh, and Jim and Penny and you that goes all the way back to a phone call in, what, 2002, something like that? Oh, uh, that, that's right, way, way oh, wow. back in the, the beginning of time. That is unbelievable. I, I just love that. You're gonna love this uh, Hanukkah weekend. Uh, can we talk about the Hanukkah weekend uh, yeah, for a Please second? do. You know, it's, if you haven't signed up to watch online yet, I really encourage you to do so because uh, it's only $79 and you get to uh, watch it now, you get to replay it if you want, you even get to download it if you want. And wow. all of that is available for only $79 and all you have to do is go to the website at the bottom of your screen, which is arudawakening.tv slash Hanukkah 2018. Th this is really a treat. And I have a, this for Hanukkah, uh, the Feast of Dedications. This is when we, uh, again, we rededicate our life to the Almighty, uh, rededicate ourselves to getting the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua taught out to the world. And part of that foundation is taking us back to Mount Sinai and what happened there. Because without that, Without the schoolmaster that leads us to the Messiah, we're, we're kind of lost. You know, a lot of people, uh, they pretend that the Bible begins with uh, Matthew chapter one, verse one. But uh, I mean, uh, you, you've gotta go back and, and go to the schoolmaster and then it's all going to sync together. Uh, yeah, and speaking of syncing things together, I mean, that's what this is all about, is figuring out when things happened and uh, you know, putting the whole story together. Uh, and that's what I love about uh, this, this weekend. We're gonna put the whole story together and uh, our guest is gonna be talking more about that, about how he put things together with Moses. 
after all of this happened. Yeah, that's right. uh, so that's going to be exciting as well. And speaking of putting things together, Michael, something you put together uh, several years, well, it took 40 years for you to put together, was the Chronological Gospels. And this month, uh, it's our first opportunity to talk about it, so I, I thought I'd bring it up, is uh, the manuscript version. This was the first hardcover uh, version of the Bible that we had. I released this on my yep. 60th birthday. Now it's uh, my 66th uh, uh, as, we, as we celebrate this time. And, uh, and this was uh, when I had the manuscript together. And this is what, it took 38 years to do that, mm -hmm. to solve every apparent contradiction in the gospel record uh, and to, to sync it all together. But then I started reading it over and over and over again. And then once I saw things in chronological order, once, once I could read it in chronological order, then we have cause and effect. Then I could understand things that I've studied my whole life that Yeshua said that I had to honestly admit, I don't get it. I, I know what the words are. I know what they are in Greek. I know what they are, some of them in Hebrew, but I don't get it. Not until I had it in chronological order, in context, and then it just, it, it just blows open the heavens. Mm. And, and you know, this, we are now, we have a copy of it right here. It was a hardcover version, the only hardcover version ever made. And uh, we had a thousand of those. They were all numbered, just like a limited edition print, uh, you know, from an artist. Mm. That's and right. uh, now and that's just, what I'm doing. Yeah. I, I, uh, they are all numbered, but now I am signing them uh, to anyone that, that stands with us, that donates, uh, just like they did uh, six years ago, a thousand dollars, and that helped us to produce uh, the, the version that everyone had. Had. And then, now, this is helping us produce a season number three in the Chronological Gospels, which is the sign of Jonah. Right. And so, uh, this is my thank you to you, and this is truly a, a, a collector's edition. We're actually gonna be able to do more things with it, too. So, the, the sign of Jonah and the uh, translations we're going to oh, Spanish. Oh, that's, that's right. And uh, we're Chinese, Russian, Russian, and Chinese, Russian, and French. This is all happening right yeah. now. Right now. So. You know, we're looking forward to getting that out to the world. Yeah, indeed. So that, all you have to do is call our number. It's a special thing. It's only available by phone. You can talk to our folks, 888-766-3610, and you can get in on this uh, special edition, very special thing that we're doing for this upcoming year. So thank you in advance. And welcome to Hanukkah. Let's roll it with our next, uh, our first guest for Hanukkah, Tim Mahoney. As we continue through the book of Acts, we find that as soon as the message of Yeshua began to spread, the Pharisees began to attack the apostles. They did not understand the manifestations of the Spirit and were ready to snuff it out. Shaul got thrown out of Jerusalem and had to leave Jerusalem under cover of darkness because he was speaking to the Greeks in the temple and the Greeks were getting so upset, these Greek Pharisees in one true voice. Michael Rood continues the story of the first apostles. These few persevered in spite of constant threats to their lives from the Pharisees. By refusing to back down, they forged a path for every believer who had come after them. Not all the Jews, it pleased the Pharisees. And this is the rulers, the Sanhedrin, the rulers. These are the people that, that wanted and put Yeshua to death. One True Voice is an exclusive teaching available only in December. It's a gift from Michael Rood to you for your love gift donation of just $50. Or with a love gift donation of $100 or more, we'll send you the One True Voice teaching plus a magnificent Torah scroll. And for the month of December, with a gift of $500 or more, we'll send you the teaching, the Torah scroll, and a six-foot Tetra scroll featuring accurate dates of every significant event in the entire Bible. It also includes New Testament dates that correlate with the Chronological Gospels Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our ministry as priests, as a royal priesthood. Call 800-788-7887. That's 800-788-7887 to make your love gift donation now and receive the One True Voice Collection or visit our website at monthlylovegift.com. Hurry, offer ends December 31st. Forbidden and forgotten, the real Mount Sinai sits silently in the Saudi desert. But the door to discovery is reopening. Hanukkah 2018 takes you back to the mountain 
to reaffirm one of the greatest discoveries in modern history, along with vivid, new evidence the world has never seen. Watch Hanukkah 2018 online, featuring Sinai pioneers Jim and Penny Caldwell, plus exciting new eyewitness evidence from national security analyst Ryan Moreau and a special guest. Watch it all, replay it, and even download it to keep. Just $79 for the whole package. Hurry, this is a limited time offer. Reserve your watch online package now at arudeawakening.tv slash Hanukkah 2018. That's arudeawakening.tv slash Hanukkah 2018. The last night that Yeshua was with his disciples, the last supper before the Passover was sacrificed, he took bread and he took wine. He said before that Abraham saw his day and rejoiced, but what does that mean, he saw his day and rejoiced? Well, it was the Melech Zadik, the king of righteousness that brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. He blessed the Most High with the blessing that Abraham taught Yitzhak, Yitzhak taught Yaakov, and is still spoken today. Whenever bread and wine is served at a Jewish table, whenever it is Sabbath, especially around the world, the bread and the wine are brought forth with this blessing. Baruch Gata Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua then said, blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood that pays the sin penalty because of the broken covenant. As often as we do this, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. So break the bread, share the wine, and we do this in remembrance of him until he comes. To launch our Feast of Hanukkah extravaganza in which we're going to be taking you to Mount Sinai with all of the men and the women who have been involved in bringing artifacts and, and bringing these representations out to the world, we have a very special guest with us and he could not be with us literally here because he's in the middle of editing the next motion picture that is going to be in more than a thousand theaters this spring. We have with us Tim Mahoney by way of Skype. Tim, thank you for being with us. It's great to be with you, Michael, and, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but as, as you mentioned, uh, we're in the thick of it right now. We are trying to release multiple films each year now. We've, we're really picking up the pace, and it's, uh, it's a big task. Well, our, our adventure really started together about 15 years ago. I just came back from Egypt and from the Red Sea Crossing site uh, to the Christian Booksellers Convention, and there I met Tim Mahoney, who was the, uh, he was the president of the International Christian Filmmakers Association, and I, I said to Tim at that time, I said, Tim, they, they found Pharaoh's chariots and armies strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Red Sea. You've got to get involved with this. I just do television, you are a filmmaker, this is something that, that you are suited for, that, that God has made you for this, and I had no idea of the amazing adventure that you would be on. How did it all start, Tim? Well, you know, becoming a filmmaker was something that, uh, that I actually didn't know I would become, because I grew up in a family that didn't have TV. When my folks got divorced, uh, 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 the TV broke and it wasn't replaced. So I got very involved with music and uh, I thought for sure I was going to be a musician. Uh, but when I was a teenager, uh, when I was 18 years old, I went to my first movie and it was a, a film called The Hiding Place. It was a Billy Graham film and it was a story of a family, uh, a Dutch family that were hiding Jewish people in their home in Holland. And that film was so powerful. I saw it three times in a row. And I think that began my interest in being involved with movies. 
And eventually I, I went to uh, two years of Bible school and then I, I went to a film school after that. And that was sort of the beginning of me becoming a filmmaker. But it took, I'll tell you what, it's been 40 years. <laughs> it took a 40 year journey of me uh, getting to a place where uh, uh, I could start to make these types of films. I made lots of commercials, Michael, uh, and I made lots of other types of productions. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, I was even involved in a, a, a TV special called Secrets of the Bible Code and helped to develop that <clears throat> and um, worked on another film. Uh, uh, was a national special called Jesus, Divine or Da Vinci. So I had been working in this area for a, a long time, very attracted to the Bible. And my family, they were Bible-believing people. And my grandmother carried around a Bible that had rubber bands around it. And uh, she, she, uh, she, would, uh, she had 46 grandchildren, and she gave verses to each one of us. And so when I started hearing, you know, the possibility that, as you mentioned, that people are searching for chariots uh, and chariot wheels on the bottom of the seafloor, I thought, wow, that is amazing. And eventually I, I was, there's a film that came out, Search for the Red Sea Crossing, right. uh, which was one of the very first films. And I actually, because I was involved with the, the uh, Christian film industry, uh, I felt I was there to serve. And I wanted to help to serve anybody I could. And I, I got involved with that film to try to help bring it to television. And eventually, I got so drawn into this story that when I saw a person by the name of Leonard Moeller in that film, I felt that I needed to contact him. And that began a relationship uh, that's lasted for, for many years now. And uh, in 2002, Leonard uh, Moeller and I uh, went to Egypt with a film crew, and this was just after 9-11. And uh, we uh, it wasn't very crowded at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. You could get a hotel room without too much trouble. But it was pretty stressful as far as you know going different places because everybody was uh, on pins and needles. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but we went through um, uh, different parts of, of Egypt. And uh, uh, one of the areas that I went to was uh, the area of the Delta. And there was a very famous Egyptologist there, Manfred Bita. And I went to his dig site because I had heard that this is where the Israelites uh, first lived. And uh, that's what the Bible said. And, and I believed that he was possibly uncovering evidence for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and But when I got to his dig site, which is very, very difficult to get to, in fact, when we were, when we were driving through the areas, I didn't know this, but I don't think we had, I don't think our, our, our Egyptian um, film production assistants uh, got all the, the correct <laughs> permits. They just drove to where we were supposed to go. And I arrive at his, at his site, and he was not happy. Uh, and, uh, and I said, listen, Manfred, I have... Uh, I have traveled around the world to meet with you, and could I at least talk with you for five minutes? And so I said, do you find evidence for the early Israelites? And he said, so far, not. And when he said that, Michael, my, my, it was like I got hit by it. Someone just took a, a two-by-four and whacked me on the side of the head because I had traveled to the other side of the world to search for evidence, and most people don't go that, that far. To search and to have this man who'd been digging there for maybe 30 or 40 years tell me that he wasn't finding evidence, it it, it started to a seed of of concern. Now, now, uh, Tim, you didn't start out as a skeptic. You started out as one who had been raised with and believed in the Bible, and you just wanted to help tell the story. You're going back to the source uh, to try to get the evidence and put it all in order, and you get hit, as you say, with a, with a sledgehammer right at the beginning of this project, uh, which has now turned into patterns of evidence. What happened uh, in that uh, crisis of faith, as you explain? Right. Well, uh, what I was, uh, I came back. I mean, I spent almost a month in Egypt, and when I came back, uh, I uh, I was sitting in an edit suite, uh, and I was looking at this footage because I want to be honest. You know, we want to be honest with ourselves about these about these events and these yeah. stories. Mm -hmm. And as I watched what he said, I, I I I just said, Lord, help me to understand what's going on here. Why why is it that he's not seeing any evidence for this? And at that moment, 
a thought came to my mind, and the room got cold, actually. I just felt the chill. And it says, everything you have believed, your family has believed, your mother has believed, is a lie. And this terror kind of came over my, my, my whole being. And, uh, and then another voice in my thoughts came, get up. Stop editing. Go to your office. And I'm in my office right now. Right behind me, you see that bookcase over there? It, uh, I, I was directed, I was like, to go to your office, go to your bookcase. I went to my bookcase and then read that book. <laughs> Somebody had given me a book by David Roll. I believe that was Jim and Penny Caldwell that gave you that book years earlier. Well, actually, uh, they, they had read it, but it was another fellow locally here who had given it to me. Oh. And he's. I just feel that you should read this book. And, and I, you know, uh, I said, thank you. I looked at it, flipped through the pages, and I put it on my bookcase, like some of those other books over there. And they're, they're there for the time when I have time to read it. But I hadn't read it yet. And I opened the book up. And there, to my surprise, was evidence for Joseph uh, that David Rowe was connecting the, the tomb and the palace. And, and that began a completely different shift in my whole uh, uh, life. And, and it started this, which I didn't know would become patterns of evidence. And so the whole idea here uh, that in, in my own life has been to, to continue to, to, to go and talk to all the different sources and basically say, well, what's really happening here? And is there a pattern of evidence? And that's why we were able to make that, that film is because there was a tremendous pattern of evidence that no one was identifying, which was much, much earlier than, than what they were thinking. Uh, but then it goes back to more complicated questions about chronology. And, um, and is history really, uh, is the history of the world really in the right chronology? Uh, that, that, that was uh, a, a really in, incredible thing. I, I got to see, you invited me up, and I got to see the first few pilots of the program, uh, which you were going to, to put out there. And it was like, Tim, get this out to the world. You need to get it out. But I had no idea. You disappeared for really a few years off my radar because of this uh, th this crisis of faith that, that brought you into uh, getting the evidence from all the archaeologists that finally turned into the movie Patterns of Evidence. And I, I really, I consider and I tell everyone, this is the most brilliant and the most important biblical documentary that has been done in the history of the human race. That is my opinion. This is absolutely brilliant. And uh, I, I was sitting in the, the theater when uh, I just got back to America from Israel. I was sitting in the theater watching this presentation and I, I just sat back in my chair when you put this all together and, and slid all the timelines together and I just sat back and I said aloud, brilliant, brilliant, because I, I saw that you were painting us into a corner uh, uh, and we were all experiencing that that crisis of faith with you, and then all of a sudden you meld it all together and it was absolutely chilling. I still get chills today thinking about that moment. And, and I thank you so much for what you've done, but that's not the end of the story, is it? Well, no, and you know, that film, there were seasons when I was wondering, you know, you said I disappeared for a while. It was so difficult because uh, what was happening was that we were, uh, after, after we were <laughs> started doing this, it seemed like it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The whole investigation was huge. And I started, um, we had a, a time when we went to Israel uh, and uh, just felt like we were supposed to go to Israel and that this, this whole story, the Exodus, was really about the nation of Israel, the birth of the nation of Israel. And uh, I, you know, when I went to Israel, um, uh, the producer there said, well, who do you want to talk to? And I said, I want to talk to the leaders of your nation. And uh, so she, uh, her father had been involved uh, in the military, and so she, her name was known, and so she made contact. And I ended up filming, uh, you know, President Shimon Peres and Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, ambassadors and Natan Sharansky, the Soviet dissident. And, and these interviews have been uh, they're like 
I'll just say it. They're like wine sitting in a, on a, in a cellar right now, uh, just waiting to be, come out in these other films as we started to see that there's an arc in history. There's, there's this arc in history of God acting in history. And so uh, a lot of people today are so um, uninformed about the history of the Bible or the events of the Bible that have led up to where we are today. And I think that part of what we're doing in patterns is just saying, okay, let's start at the beginning. Uh, I started at Exodus in this particular case, and I'm working my way through history, uh, doing, in fact, I, <laughs> this is, this is a, you know, patterns of evidence, the Bible. Uh, you know, this is a huge, this is a huge document of, of all the different episodes that I could see that have patterns that we could show and investigate. And it's the vision of what can happen. And when you look at those patterns, they testify, I believe, allowing people, our approach is that we allow people to make a decision. We're not saying you have to believe this, but I'm just saying, hey, the Bible says these things happen. Let's go look in the world of archaeology and history and see what we can find. And well, what we end up doing is finding these amazing patterns. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Tim, in your first uh, movie, Patterns of Evidence, you took us uh, to the Red Sea, and you you discovered things along the way that have solved problems that have plagued scholars for literally for hundreds of years. You found the solutions, and you're laying those out before us. Now you, you get us to the Red Sea, and so uh, at the end of the movie, I'm just sitting on the edge, let's go, let's go to Mount Sinai, and I know that that is where you wanted to go, but uh, that journey was fraught with danger. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, because this is where we're eventually going to get. Well, you talked about being at the Red Sea. I remember standing with Leonard Moeller on the sea uh, in 2002 at Nuiba. And, uh, and Leonard uh, said to me, I believe that I'm going to go to Saudi Arabia. And, and in fact, he said this to me, I think, more than once. He said, will you come with me? And I'm thinking to myself, I know a bit of the history of all this, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I, Leonard, I, I don't want, I don't want, what do I say? I, I want to be respectful, but I, I don't see how in the world that you or I will get into Saudi Arabia. I, it's just not going to happen because I know how difficult that is, and nobody gets into Saudi Arabia. Right. And th so that was in 2002. Well, uh, I believe that I got, I think what happened was that year you called me. Uh, I think you were in Jerusalem. I'm not sure what what time it was, but you were, and I got this call from you, and you said, you need to meet someone. You remember that? Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and and that was, you You had met Jim and Penny Caldwell, and you wanted to set up a meeting. Right. And so we ended up uh, um, having this call. Leonard was here uh, when I when we were able to make that call. And it was interesting that he would be here because he was here at different times, but it just so happened that when you called me, Leonard was here, we were filming something. And uh, uh, so we had this call with Jim and Penny Caldwell and uh, things, then we basically, after that call, we, we, I'll tell you something very interesting. As they were getting to know each other, they found out how old each other were. And I don't know how they happened to ask this, uh, but they, but I think we talked about a birthday. Someone was having a birthday. And as it turned out, both Leonard Moeller and Jim Caldwell were born the same day in the same year. And it's just, a, it's a very interesting coincidence that two people from the opposite sides of the world would, uh, uh, that were both passionate <clears throat> about going to Mount Sinai were born exactly at that time. And, and, uh -huh. and uh, Jim uh, ascended Mount Sinai on two different dates, two different years, and he ended up being on the top of Mount Sinai on his birthday. <laughs> on the very day that also Leonard Moeller was born. So, you know, we see the hand of the Almighty weaving things together. We see the literally the rocks are crying out. And I, and I got a call from uh, Jim and Penny just before you all went into Mount Sinai. And they said, we want you to know, don't tell anyone. We want you to know, pray about it, because we're gonna go in there with Tim Mahoney, with Leonard Moeller. We're going to go to Mount Sinai. A and uh, th that, I, I know, at the end of it, there was, uh, you were afraid for your lives. Uh, there, uh, that, that mountain is being protected, and rightfully so. Well, um, we were, uh, how we got there, 
I mean, a lot of people have had to sneak in the Monsanto and everything. But we actually uh, take, took a more diplomatic approach, and somehow uh, we were able to, with a tour, with some form of tourism, able to go there with visas. So uh, uh, Leonard, I think, was the first person from Sweden to ever really get a visa into Saudi Arabia. And uh, we, uh, so we went, into, we went there, and it was a, a whole other world. I mean, I had never been in, in that part of the world before. And uh, when we got there, um, uh, my understanding is Dr. Glenn Fritz had gotten permission from the Ministry of the Interior to search for marble. And so, uh, and as Jim and Penny would tell you, that sometimes one side of the Saudi Arabia doesn't know what the other side is doing. <laughs> and so even though we had permission to go there, uh, once we arrived in that area, uh, the locals didn't get the uh, memo. <laughs> so, you know, everything was okay for the first 24 hours, but after a while, the word got out. And um, we were able to to go uh, into around and look with permission, and we went through the altar site, and we went up the mountain. There's marble up there, and that's what Glenn Fritz was looking at. He had, he had uh, a, you know, to be able to look for marble. And, um, you know, they have these this ability to scan from satellites uh, minerals and different things. And so I believe those pillars down below were, uh, were, were marble pillars. And, and so we went up to the source where those pillars could have been uh, taken from, uh, carved out. And actually, I think there was a pillar even up, up on the top or part of a pillar. So uh, when we came down, it was a very... You know, it's like, wow, this is amazing. The Caldwells were surprised. Wow, we've, you know, never been like this as easy. But when we came down the mountain, that's when the challenges uh, started to happen. Well, we're going to have to take a break for just a minute, Tim. Uh, but uh, when we come back, we want to get more into that adventure. And then that's going to set things up to where uh, for this entire weekend coming up uh, for Hanukkah, where we are going to find that others went in. They went in as skeptics, not as you, as a believer, but as skeptics and found the very evidence that uh, that, that you uh, were denied as far as being able to film it and come out with that film. And so we're gonna tell the rest of the story when we come back right after this. We are back with Tim Mahoney to kick off our Hanukkah, Mount Sinai weekend. And Tim, uh, you left off, we were at Mount Sinai, uh, you, you got up on the mountain and everything was going smooth, but then, the world started falling apart before your eyes. Well, when we came down, that's when the, the tone changed. I think what happened was the, the locals came and talked with our guides. And our guides weren't from that part of Saudi Arabia. They were from a completely different uh, area. And there was a conflict that started to, to occur. Is we had permission and an itinerary which was approved. and uh, But the locals basically said, you need to get out of here. I mean... Uh, you can't stay here. And that became a challenge all throughout the trip where, where we were supposed to be one place, according to the itinerary with the Saudi government, but the locals were not happy with us being there. So uh, we did um, actually, uh, you know, we, we had the local uh, chieftain or whatever come and visit. Uh, they're very hosp the hospitality is wonderful. And you have to understand that the local people have been trying to protect these uh, locations because they believe they're sacred as well. And they don't want someone coming in taking anything. And we weren't going to do that. We were, I was just there with a camera filming and I had gotten a permission to bring a camera along and everything. Uh, but it was such a, a politically hot potato. Uh, and, uh, but when this chieftain came, uh, they brought a lamb or a goat, I think it might've been. And they, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had, uh, I think Jim Penny called it a, a Passover meal. I'm just saying that you had everything, the kind of ingredients that you would have, you know, but we ate, uh, uh, you know, roasted, uh, uh, you know, we had, we had all the things that you would have if you were going to do this. They, they were kind of pointing that out and, uh, at the mountain, yeah, and then, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the cooking on the sage, the, the, the bread, the unleavened, that's just all part of the culture. That's the way the Bedouins cook today. And with the lamb, uh, yeah, it would be the elements of a Passover meal. Yeah. 
So anyway, the Caldwells were, were observant of that. And, and then what we ended up doing was that then we had to leave. And I think I'm trying to remember in our itinerary which place we went to. So I'm not as clear. You could ask them about that. But uh, when we did get to the, the location for the split rock, that's when basically uh, we were told, you know, we were there for about uh, several hours. And then when we came down, uh, we were told, you know, you have to leave here in five minutes or we're going to kill you. You know, it was sort of that, <laughs> that, that clear. Right, you right. Know? And, and while they're saying this, they, they have got the arms with them. I mean, they, they've got the rifles. Uh, there, there's, uh, that, that threat is taken seriously, is it not? Yeah, right. I mean, you're not going to basically wait uh, to, to find out, uh, you know. And so, uh, and <laughs> they, they, were, they were trying to they were trying to enforce the idea that they didn't want anybody there, and so we had to go. And I had been filming, you know. I had I had uh, several cameras, and I was filming. I'd probably filmed some of the best footage that I had ever filmed, uh, and I'd filmed in Egypt, and and so I had a lot of beautiful footage of all these locations. Uh, at Jebel Laws, uh, uh, the, uh, at Split Rock, uh, where the Caldwells have been. And then we went to the sea and to the, to the sea crossing area over on, uh, at Aqaba. And we went through all the different areas that the Caldwells have thought uh, were locations where the Israelites would have come up from the sea and gone on to, to the mountain. And I think we might have even been over where Jethro uh, had lived. And so... Boy, was I feeling great about all this. But uh, uh, then when it came time to leave the country, uh, I had to uh, forfeit my footage. And uh, uh, we were able to keep our still photography, but we weren't able to keep any video. Oh, and, well, that, that, that's a tragedy. I mean, you, this is the next movies that are going to be shown, and you've been there, you've actually, in, in high definition, uh, you've, you've filmed all these art, uh, artifacts that are there, the, the altar, the golden calf, uh, the split rock, the altar, all these things, and now, just as you're leaving the country, it all disappears. Yeah. And you ask yourself, well, what was this, what's going to happen here? You know, it's puzzling. But it was very valuable for us to go there. And uh, so for, for a number of years, we were hoping that, you know, it would be returned or, or you know, we would, get, uh, we would get this footage back. Uh, but we never got it back. And, uh, uh, and, and then there was this, you, you talked about this long season, this long gestation of trying to understand what is it that we're trying to do here? It seemed like there are so many pieces and so many people involved, and it was such a giant project that kept getting bigger and bigger. And eventually I, I started to understand that it was that big, that this is a, an enormous story, and it's an enormous investigation. I would probably say it's one of the biggest investigations of the Bible that's ever happened. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it includes all different viewpoints. So, what we decided and what we learned over the years was that, you know, the first film took 12 years to make. And I realized I couldn't take 12 years to make any more films or I'm not going to be around, <laughs> you know, if you try to make a lot of them. So um, what we started to do is we were being trained, I think. I was being trained as to how to basically go about this. And that I'm, I'm really more of a, you know, I'm a documentary journalist. And I'm hearing, we, we learned that was a real value in listening to different viewpoints, uh, because it allows you to uh, to see well which one is stronger. Why do people say the traditional mountain is where it is, and somebody says it's Har Karkum is where Mount Sinai is, and other people say Jebel Laws. And so, what I have done now is gone and started to investigate the entire story. And I've got you know several researchers now. And we're continuing to film. We have these trips that go off into different parts of the world and filming each year to develop this series of films on patterns. And um, the, the film that I have called The Moses Controversy is coming up in the future. And someone would say, well, what's that about? And why would you do that? And I don't know if your viewers are aware of this, but there's a lot of criticism about Moses even writing the story. So what they're saying is Moses really didn't write the first five books of the Bible, that this was written a thousand years later by people who didn't even live in the area. Uh, they were just creating a history for themselves. And I thought, if we're going to take the word seriously, 
we if there's supposed to be an altar at some place, we have to know was it really truly written? Because if, if you're gonna if you're gonna say I'm looking for an altar or pillars or these events happen where they were worshiping uh, a golden calf, I thought the fir- next place I have to start as much as I want to go to the sea crossing or want to go to Jebel Laws or want to go investigate these locations, I have to solve this next problem, and that has to do with could Moses have been the the author. Uh, of of the first books of the Bible, and that's that's what the Moses controversy is. And we uncover again amazing evidence, a pattern of evidence that shows that the that the first uh, uh, the ability to write the alphabet shows up at the same time in history as the Israelites were in uh, that we believe in Egypt. That same time period is when the alphabet starts to show up, and that's something we'll talk about in the future. But that's the reason why, as I've gone into this, Michael, I've realized that. If I'm going to be thorough about it, and if I'm going to build a case, I have to really investigate all the possibilities, put the evidence on the table, and then let the audience decide, you know, well, um, what is this? Because what happens is that the, the, the next generation, a lot of them are hearing negative things about the Bible, and they're, they're basically saying, well, you know, uh, I don't know if I believe that. That's just a fairy tale. And my and my professor at the university tells me it's a fairy tale. And so uh, I'm here to say, you know what? <laughs> there are patterns of evidence. We're taking a scientific approach to look for these things. And guess what? You can't plant that evidence. That's right. Now, uh, I, I know that uh, the Israel Department of Antiquities, Josias, uh, refused to even look at the evidence of Mount Sinai because he, he said and stated it, that Mount Sinai is a literary invention and no one will find it. He said it was all made up. And this is the position of of a professional archeologists, uh, so to speak. And we find that, that people will, will make up stories, they will just, uh, uh, you know, anything to take people away from what the scripture says, but you have found evidence and patterns of evidence of the writing of the scripture, and I, I'm very excited about this next, uh, this next film that's gonna be out. And I want you to come back uh, just before the film releases, and I want you to take us uh, a bit on that journey. Will you do that with us? Oh, absolutely, yes. And, and uh, you know, when we do this type of, of uh, filmmaking and this type of work, you know, uh, I've, at times, you know, the Israelites were following a pillar of fire, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden they go, hey, the pillar of fire is moving, the cloud is moving. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like that a little bit. Uh, uh, I know in general where we're gonna be going. And I know that the big question is, does God act in history? Has God acted in history, and have have those events of God acting in history been recorded? And it's telling us a, a, a context of the world that we live in. That you know, do we live in a world that was created by a God, uh, by our, by a God, and or do we live in a world that evolved, uh, and it's just sort of evolving here? And these are the big questions uh, that people are asking, and that's the reason why I think it's so important to to find answers to these questions because. The, the children that are, and grandchildren, um, I have four children that are, that are married and eight grandchildren. And uh, they're asking questions about, about these things uh, because they get, at, because they're living in this culture. And you can see that people are looking for answers. And that's the reason why I think it's important. Some people have faith and they don't need to have necessarily anything proven to them. But I've met a lot of other people that are that are comforted that knowing that wait a minute are you telling me that there's a pattern here that matches the story of joseph in egypt (laughs) are you telling me that there's plagues and there's all these things that are happening we're saying yeah yeah there it is you can see it and what's interesting michael is that the archaeologists want to pin down this this evidence to one time i'm sorry they want to basically say the exodus had to happen at one time in history and they're not open to anything else. They've, they've decided that and the case is closed. They do not want to reopen the case. Um, and I'm uh, and basically what Patterns of Evidence is doing is saying, we're gonna reopen this case. Well, I appreciate you reopening the case, uh, Tim. And uh, uh, you know, when we met the, the 15 years ago, uh, I had no idea. You know, I just came back from Egypt, just inspired. It's just, this story has got to be told 
but I knew that, that with what I do, that I, I couldn't tell the story properly, and at the time, I had no idea that you had already uh, met Leonard Muller and that there was something going on there. I connected you with Jim and Penny Caldwell, who are gonna be with us here uh, during the, the Hanukkah weekend, and you guys I ended up going to, uh, to, to Mount Sinai together, and, uh, and, and all the other team that you put together. I, I know uh, the, the risk that you took on this, and I, I thank you for all that you've done, and I see the hand of the Almighty uh, directing your life on this, and uh, as Jim and I were talking about this uh, with Penny a, a couple years ago, uh, Jim and I have been, and Penny, and we've been trying to get this message out ever since Ron Wyatt gave me the first video of Jim and Penny uh, at the Split Rock and saying he couldn't tell me who these people were, their lives were in danger, and I've been trying to get this message out, and Jim had, and uh, uh, between the two of us, we, uh, I believe it was 13 uh, heart bypasses. We, we tried when we were young to get this out, but we, we see that now you are a grandfather, you continue to carry this thing out, and you're opening the eyes of the next generation. It's all in his timing. You know, uh, Michael, uh, the idea that Saudi Arabia uh, that Midian is in Saudi Arabia and that the mountain might be in Saudi Arabia. In our research, we found out that this wasn't necessarily a new idea. There was actually a, a, a gentleman in uh, the 1800s, I think it's Charles Beek. Have you heard of him? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, you know, we we went and uh, started reading what he had done. And um, and he was absolutely a proponent of a uh, Gulf of Aqaba crossing. And he was a proponent of that the mountain was in Saudi Arabia. And I don't know if you know this, but he was punished for that. He was a, he was a very awarded uh, scholar, and he was a geographer, and he was a, a biblical scholar. And when he came back uh, to England, he actually was stripped of his, of his medal, uh, one of his prestigious medals, uh, because people couldn't think of the idea that this would possibly have been the, the way it happened or where it might be. But there were scholars, other scholars, like Frank Moore Cross, a Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, who also looked at this. And and uh, because of the connection to Midian, and there are other connections there. And I do know that when I was in Saudi Arabia, we went to a museum, and um, uh, there with Jim and Penny, and one of the, the, the man who was in charge of the museum started talking about the fact that the Israelites were in Saudi Arabia, and that they wandered, and that they came up through this from the south. And they came up, and and there wasn't a problem at all with that idea. Uh, so uh, part of it is that uh, in my particular role as a filmmaker is I'm a journalist, and so I'm I'm going to basically try to understand what the possibilities might be, as opposed to saying, oh no, there's no possibility here. But obviously, there's a great reaction against it, reactions over history. Uh, because people are set in, in the way they, they they think about things. So, but I think that it's, uh, so I'm, I'm excited to actually to explore it and to understand it. And it basically has strengthened my own faith once I've been able to see these different patterns. Political correctness is nothing new. Political correctness uh, uh, concerning uh, someone's attitude toward the Bible and in history, uh, this has been going on as long as people have been trying to prove that uh, there is no God and that we're just the result of uh, aberrant chance mutations in the purely mechanical universe. Uh, you know, that, that, that is being protected by academia and uh, even Bible schools. You, you found that in patterns of evidence that there are actual uh, entire Bible schools and seminaries that have, have been so, uh, so embedded in this historical narrative of when the Exodus happened that they, they refuse to look at the evidence. I think that it's threatening. And if they feel that their idea is threatened, they don't want to engage in it. And uh, and I think that what we decided was that it was better to basically uh, just uh, go to go to the public, and 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 actually make a film that creates an argument, as opposed to be in a circumstance where you are held to uh, the rules of of the academy. Uh, basically, say, well, let's understand what people are saying. And let's see how much sense they're making. Because sometimes 
uh, they're not making as much sense as they need to make. And so you're going, yeah, well, I can't quite buy what you're selling here, and this makes more sense to me. And so uh, it makes more sense to me uh, that that uh, that the the Bible has a historical pattern that's showing up than it does that the chronology is sacred. And the thing that I was surprised by was that people were more upset that we were suggesting there might be something wrong with the chronology than that than than that the Bible was not historically accurate. And these were people in the Bible universities and, and colleges. They were more troubled, deeply upset <laughs> that I would suggest that the chronology, you know, that they're, hey, let's take another look at this, than they were that people were saying there's no evidence here, and they could live with that. That That really is a the sad state of religion, in my opinion. Uh, we, we have uh, just a couple minutes, Tim. Uh, we have Jim and Penny Caldwell that are going to be with us uh, th- this weekend. Uh, you are in uh, Saudi Arabia with them. You are at Mount Sinai with them. Uh, they're gonna be uh, taking us on that journey. Uh, Joel Richardson, who came back with the drone footage, 4K footage, uh, uh, which uh, uh, actually has seen more evidence that uh, neither the Caldwells, I know that you didn't see it, the Caldwells didn't see it, but he has more evidence, and Jim and Penny are gonna present that. Uh, Andrew, I believe uh, you, you have uh, uh, also spoken with him, and he is here uh, going to be showing some of his footage on that. Um, th- th- is it encouraging that, uh, that, that more and more people have been able to get in there and get this information out? Yes, and basically what I've decided was that these people, such as the Caldwells and and Andrew and, and uh, Joel, they're, they're all part of the story. They're part of the, the journey uh, of, of investigating this, just like Charles Beek and uh, others uh, that have throughout history had this magnetism to search for the, for the journey and the route and the evidences for the Bible. That's uh, what I started to understand was that they were becoming a part of the story of the Exodus. Uh, and uh, so I've been included Included them in this, uh, you know, larger investigation because I'll tell you what, you know, you look at Ron Wyatt and people have been critical of him and, and the different things that he's pursued and said and, and whatever. Uh, uh, but I looked at it as well and I realized that a lot of people never went to search for Noah's Ark or they never went to search for Mount Sinai. W- what caused this man to go and search for these things when others were, you know, just sort of uh, armchair quarterbacks. And so that's part of the story. I thank you, Tim, for being a part of, of this and, and taking the time away. I know you gotta get right back to the, uh, the, the editing right now, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next film coming out, and we'll have you back uh, here, a live uh, uh, presentation, but get back to work. You've got the work of the Almighty that you have to do. Thank you for taking a break and being with us, Tim. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, hearing a little bit of what we're doing, and thank you, Michael. Okay. Well, Torah fans, uh, uh, this is the launch of our Hanukkah weekend, to have Tim here with us, to have all the guests with us uh, that are going to be with us uh, for this whole weekend. We know that uh, this is going to be broadcast, and, and you can uh, sign up, you can be a part of this uh, for the whole weekend, and uh, uh, th- this is really the rocks crying out. People have held their voice too long, the skeptics have had too much of the airwaves, and the Almighty is not going to be squelched. He wants his message to get out. And as Yeshua said, go out there into the world, make disciples and teach them what I taught you. And the foundation of what Yeshua taught us, it takes us right back to Mount Sinai, it takes us back to the Torah. Everything that is in the Gospels was already written in the Torah. Yeshua going up to the Feast of the Lord, everything that that had to to transpire uh, about the prophet of whom Moses spoke, it it is now all coming to pass and it's now being brought out in the open so that we can better understand the Gospel of the Kingdom. It's the same story from Genesis 1-1, Revelation 22-21. Thanks for being with us and Continue on this weekend.